Chapter Three of the Law of the Honey Bee by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bee Masters in the Middle Ages. Students of old books on the honey bee are generally struck with two very remarkable characteristics about them their invariable fine old classic and romantic flavour and their ingenious leavening of a great mass of quite obvious fable by a very small modicum of enduring fact it is difficult to realise until one has delved deep into these curious old records how completely they are dyed through and through with the picturesque but mainly erroneous ideas of the ancient classic bee fathers the writers were almost without exception earnest practical men whose chief interest in life was the study and pursuit of their craft but they seem one and all to have laboured under the idea that it was their bounden duty to uphold everything written about bees by the old greek and roman literati and that it would be the rankest heresy to advance any new truth garnered from their individual experience unless it could be supported by ample testimony from the same infallible source they seem to look upon the works of aristotle virgil pliny and the rest as so many divine revelations of the mystery of beecraft all sufficing by nightly perfect and they continually quoted from them in support of their own contentions or in refutation of the statements of others much as teachers of religion refer doubters to bible texts the bee masters of the middle ages were however not alone in adopting this peculiar attitude of mind it seems to have been the prevailing habit of the time with all classes one might almost be justified in concluding that the study of nature in those days had no other object with these inveterate old classicians but to support what had already been set down by their revered oracles it was enough that a thing had been written in greek or latin in the literary youth of the world it was immaculate the first and last word on the question and if their personal observations seemed at variance with any statement of the old world writers then the contradiction was only an apparent one and could no doubt be easily resolved by a more learned exponent of these b scriptures of ancient days it is certainly at first glance a matter for wonder that men could pass their whole lives in the pursuit of the craft and yet manage to preserve uncorrupted a faith which seems so readily and at so many points assailable but it must be remembered that any observation of the inner life of the honey-bee was then an extremely difficult thing it was next to impossible to see anything that was going on inside the hives in use at that day pliny mentions a hive made of what he calls mirror stone which was probably talc and through the transparent sides of which the working of the bees could be seen but nothing of the kind seems to have been attempted among english bee masters until the seventeenth century moreover even if the whole hive had been made of clear glass the observer would have been very little the wiser he would have had the outer sides of the two end combs in view and he would have seen much coming and going among the bees with an occasional glimpse of the queen but all the wonderful activity of the hive so laboriously ascertained by latter-day observers 
with the help of so many ingenious appliances goes on entirely in the hidden recesses of the combs and any attempt to study this life under the conditions appertaining in the middle ages would have been manifestly futile it was not until huber's leaf hive was invented when it became to some extent possible to divide the combs for a short time without hopelessly disturbing the bees that any real progress in bee knowledge was made the modern observation hive wherein the bees are compelled to build their combs between glass partitions one over the other instead of side by side was a still greater advance and rendered the whole interior of the bee dwelling available for study but it is open to objection that bee life in such a contrivance is carried on under two artificial conditions in a natural bee nest the combs are built roughly side by side and the brood is reared in the centre area of each comb the surface covered by the breeding cells diminishing outwards in each direction thus the brood nest takes a globular form with the honey stores above and around it and this natural arrangement is inevitably destroyed in a hive where the combs are superimposed and not collateral in the face therefore of the practical impossibility of learning anything about bees when they were housed in the usual straw skep the old bee masters confined themselves to a repetition of the beliefs of the ancient writers deftly interwoven with speculations of their own which as no one was in a position to refute them were advanced with all the more daring and assurance they seem to have been in the main agreed on the point that the ordinary generative principle otherwise universal throughout creation was miraculously dispensed with in the single case of the honey-bee moses ruston who was bee master to king charles the second and who published his further discovery of bees so late as the year sixteen seventy nine believed that the worker bees gathered from the flowers not only the germs of life but the actual corporeal substance of the young bees he pointed triumphantly to the little globular lumps of many-coloured pollen which bees so industriously fetch into the hives during the breeding season and asserted that these were the actual bodily matter from which the young bees developed he also maintained that every hive was ruled over by a king but here ruston was evidently trying to serve two masters no doubt he was a true abhorrer and heartily detested anything at variance with the doctrine of the divine right of monarchs he had faithfully copied from virgil as to the gathering of this generative substance from the flowers but he felt that as the king's bee master it was incumbent on him to put in a good word for the restored monarchy if he could there were still many in the realm who were altogether opposed to the restoration and probably more who were waverers between the faiths and ruston doubtless saw that if he could point to any parallel instance in nature where the system of monarchy was the divinely ordained state he would be furnishing his patron with a magnificent argument in favour of his kingship and one moreover which would especially appeal to the ignorant and superstitious masses no doubt however in taking up this position ruston was only echoing the belief immemorially established among the bee-men of the past the single large bee 
which all knew to exist in each hive was generally looked upon as the absolute ruler of the community it is variously described as a king or queen by writers in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries but only in the sense of a governor and the word chosen largely depended on the sex of the august person who happened to occupy the english throne at the time thus ruston very wisely discarded the notion of a queen bee when he had to deal with charles the second butler perhaps the most learned of the mediaeval writers on the honey-bee as astutely forbore to mention the word king his book being published in the reign of queen anne he calls it the feminine monarchy but seems to have no more suspected the truth that the large bee was really the mother of the whole colony than any of his predecessors almost alone in his day however he refuses to accept the flower theory of bee generation and asserts that the worker bees and drones are the females and males respectively but he says they engender not as other living creatures only they suffer their drones among them for a season by whose masculine virtue they strangely conceive and breed for the preservation of their sweet kind he gets over the difficulty of there being no drones in the hive for nine months in the year during part of which time breeding goes actively forward by asserting that the worker bees immaculately conceive of the drones for the season their summer impregnation sufficing until the drones reappear in the may of the following year thus without guessing it he was very near the discovery of one of the most astounding facts in nature that the queen bee of a hive after a single traffic with a drone continues to produce fertile eggs for the rest of her life which may extend to as long as three or even four years butler's book is rich in the quaint bee lore of his times he tells us the queen bee has under her subordinate governors and leaders for difference from the rest they bear for their crest a tuft or tossel in some coloured yellow in some murray in manner of a plume whereof some turn downward like an ostrich feather others stand upright like a hern top in less than a quarter of an hour he assures us you may see three or four of them come forth of a good stall before their continual labour have worn these ornaments and any warm spring or summer morning if you watch a hive of bees at work you may chance upon much the same thing in some flowers notably the evening primrose the pollen grains have a way of clinging together in threads and these festoons often catch in the antennae of the foraging bees giving much the same appearance of a plume or tassel as butler saw in his day he gives some advice as to the deportment of a good bee-master which is well worth quoting if thou wilt have the favour of thy bees that they sting thee not thou must avoid such things as offend them thou must not be unchaste or uncleanly for impurity and sluttishness themselves being most chaste and neat they utterly abhor thou must not come among them smelling of sweat or having a stinking breath caused either through eating of leeks onions garlic and the like or by any other means the noisomeness whereof is corrected with a cup of beer and therefore it is not good to come among them before you have drunk thou must not be given to surfeiting and drunkenness 
thou must not come puffing and blowing unto them neither hastily stir among them nor violently defend thyself when they seem to threaten thee but softly moving thy hand before thy face gently putting them by and lastly thou must be no stranger unto them in a word thou must be chaste cleanly sweet sober quiet and familiar so will they love thee and know thee from all other thus the good bee-master according to butler is necessarily a compendium of all the virtues and nothing more seems to be wanted to bring about the millennium than to induce all mankind to become keepers of bees writers on the honey-bee in medieval times vied with each other in their testimony to the extraordinary powers and intelligence of their hive people but perhaps a story gravely related by butler outdoes them all he prefaces it by declaring that bees are so wise and skilful as not only to descry a certain little god almighty though he came among them in the likeness of a wafer cake but also to build him an artificial chapel he goes on to relate that a certain simple woman having some stalls of bees that yielded not unto her her desired profit but did consume and die of the murrain made her moan to another woman more simple than herself who gave her counsel to get a consecrated host and put it among them according to whose advice she went to the priest to receive the host which when she had done she kept it in her mouth and being come home again she took it out and put it into one of her hives whereupon the murrain ceased and the honey abounded the woman therefore lifting up the hive at the due time to take out the honey saw there most strange to be seen a chapel built by the bees with an altar in it the walls adorned by marvellous skill of architecture with windows conveniently set in their places also a door and a steeple with bells and the host being laid upon the altar the bees making a sweet noise flew around it this story is only paralleled by another equally ancient wherein it is related that some thieves broke into a church and stole the silver casket in which the holy wafers were kept they found one wafer in the box and this they hid under a hive before making off with the more intrinsically valuable part of their booty in the night it seems the owner of the hive was awakened by the most ravishing strains of music coming at set intervals from the direction of his bee garden he went out with a lantern to ascertain the cause of it and discovered it to proceed from the interior of one of his hives full of perturbation at this miracle he went and roused the bishop and acquainted him with the extraordinary state of affairs and the bishop coming with his retinue and lifting up the hive they found that the bees had taken possession of the consecrated wafer and placed it in the upper part of their hive having first made for it a box of the whitest wax an exact replica of the one stolen and all around this box there were choirs of bees singing and keeping watch over it as monks do in their chapel with which story adds the narrator prophetically i doubt not but some incredulous people will quarrel in their directions for hiving a swarm the medieval bee-masters were always quaintly explicit the dressing of the skep 
which was to receive the swarm was a particularly elaborate process when the skep was new you were recommended to scour it out with a handful of sweet herbs such as thyme marjoram or hyssop and this was to be followed by a second dressing of honey and water or milk and salt but the preparation of an old skep must have been a rather disgusting affair you were to put two or three handfuls of malt or peas or other corn in the hive and let a hog eat thereof meanwhile do you so turn the hive that some foam or froth which the hog maketh in eating may go all about the hive and then wipe the hive lightly with a linen cloth and so will the bees like this hive better than the new when the swarm was up and busy in their dance you were to play them a fit of mirth on a basin warming pan or kettle to make them more speedily light we are assured that the swarm would fly faster or slower according to the noise made if the fit of mirth were in rapid measure the bees would fly fast and high but with a soft leisurely music they would go slowly and soon descend this curious custom of ringing the bees is undoubtedly of roman origin but whether it was introduced by caesar's followers or those of claudius in the first century or whether the old english bee masters themselves derived it from their classic reading is hard to determine it is still to be heard in many country districts and its exponents seem to retain all the faith of their forefathers in its efficacy probably in medieval times when bee gardens were much more plentiful than they are now the custom had at least one undeniable merit it proclaimed to the various hive owners in the vicinity that a swarm was in the air and that its rightful owner was on the alert in this way no doubt dishonest claims to its possession were largely prevented or at least discouraged the question whether the noise made by ringing has any real effect on the swarming bees is still not absolutely decided with the exception of the old skeppists not a few of whom still exist in out-of-the-way rural corners modern apiculturalists have long discarded the custom as a gross superstition but it has recently been suggested that the din made by old-fashioned bee-keepers when a swarm is up may have a real use after all it is conjectured that the cloud of bees which at first is nothing but a chaos of flashing wings the whole contingent darting and whirling about indiscriminately over a large area together is really dispersing in search of the queen the suggestion put forward is that they follow her by ear as she is supposed to utter a peculiar piping sound when flying the din of the key and pan may it is said prevent the bees hearing this note and following her in her first erratic convolutions and thus the swarm is more likely to pitch on a station near home the theory is interesting but hardly tenable old popular observances of this kind are seldom based on even the vaguest thread of fact and it is much more probable that no effect whatever is produced on the bees by the ringing with regard to the right of the beekeeper to follow his swarm into a neighbour's land it is interesting to have the assurance of one of these ancient writers that if they will not be stayed but hasting on still go beyond your bounds the ancient law of christendom permitteth you to pursue them 
whithersoever for the recovery of your own but the writer adds if your swarm goes so fast and so far that you lose sight and hearing of them you also lose all right and property in them in this case you have no legal alternative but to leave the bees to whomsoever may first find them in view of recent disputes on this matter wherein the law laid down appears to have been both vague and arbitrary it is useful to be able to point to so ancient an authority in vindication of the beekeeper's rights there is hardly any detail in bee government which had not its curious observance or superstition in medieval times one and all seemed to believe in the old virgilian notion that bees carried about little stones to balance their flight during windy weather and some even thought that flowers were carried about in the same way red-coloured clothing was supposed to be particularly offensive to bees and one is warned not to venture near the apiary thus attired in the hives the old bees and the young were believed to occupy separate quarters in regard to this it is a well-attested fact that during the height of the honey season the bees found in the upper stories of a hive are principally young ones who have not yet flown we are told that if any of the bees have not returned to the hive at the end of the day the queen goes out to find them and show them the way back no one need be in any fear of overlooking the ruler of the hive because she can be known by her lofty pace and countenance expressing majesty and she hath a white spot in her forehead glistering like a diadem an old writer advises that all the hives should have holes bored right through them to prevent spider webs he was also of opinion that the bees swarmed because of the queen's tyranny and if she followed them they put her to death he informs us that the drones were honey-bees which had lost their stings and grown fat this was a very old idea with which the sceptical butler dealt in the following fashion the general opinion anent the drone is that he is made of a honey-bee that hath lost her sting which is even as likely as that a dwarf having his guts pulled out should become a giant but the bee masters of the middle ages were ever intolerant of other people's mistaken ideas while supporting with the gravest argument and show of learning equally benighted superstitions of their own a little book published in sixteen fifty six and called the country housewife's garden is interesting as it was probably written for cottagers by one almost in the same humble walk of life whereas the bee books generally of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries were for the most part the work of men of considerably higher station this book almost alone of its kind harbours no fine theories on beekeeping but keeps throughout to rule of thumb methods the writer evidently caring little for speculation as to the origin of bees but confining his remarks to practical honey getting takes up the following wholesome position much discounting there is of and about the master bees and of their degrees order and government but the truth in this point is rather imagined than demonstrated there are some conjectures of it that is to say we see in the combs diverse greater houses than the rest and we commonly hear the night before they cast sometimes one bee sometimes two or more bees 
give a loud and several sound from the rest and sometimes bees of greater bodies than the common sort but what of this i lean not on conjectures but love to set down that i know to be true and leave these things to them that love to divine the greater houses here mentioned were no doubt the large cells in which the queens are bred just before swarming time as many as nine or ten of these are sometimes to be found in one hive the same writer has the inevitable ill word against the drones these he says are by all probability and judgment an idle kind of bees and wasteful which have lost their stings and so being as it were gelded become idle and great they hate the bees and cause them cast the sooner never did creature come by so bad a name and so undeservedly as the luckless drone with these old scribes another of them speaks of the drone as a gross hive bee without sting which hath been always reputed a greedy lozzle and therefore he that is quick at meat and slow at work is fitted with this title for howsoever he brave it with his round velvet cap his side gown his full paunch and his loud voice yet he is but an idle companion living by the sweat of others brows for he worketh not at all either at home or abroad and yet spendeth as much as two labourers you shall never find his more without a good drop of the purest nectar in the heat of the day he flieth abroad aloft and about and that with no small noise as though he would do some great act but it is only for his pleasure and to get him a stomach and then returns he presently to his cheer but it is among the writings of the old bee-men with a taste for the quack doctor's art that some of the quaintest notions are to be found we are told that honey well rubbed into the scalp night and morning is a sovereign remedy for baldness and if it was mixed with a few dead bees and a little old comb well pounded it was still more efficacious dead bees dried and reduced to a powder form a principal ingredient in all sorts of nostrums of the time this powder mixed with water and drunk every morning is recommended as an unfailing cleanser to the system and if the heads of a large number of bees are collected burned and the ashes compounded with a little honey it makes an excellent salve for all sorts of eye disorders there was a famous preparation called oxymel which was in great vogue in medieval times it seems to have been nothing more than a mixture of honey water and vinegar but it was accredited with extraordinary virtues it was an infallible cure for sciatica gout and kindred ailments and one writer also tells us that it was good to gargarize with in a squinancy but honey and dead bees were not the only products of the hives which were pressed into medical service wax was also believed to have exceptional curative powers in all sorts of human ills it had the faculty of curing ulcers and if the quantity of a peas in wax be swallowed down of nurses it doth dissolve the milk curdled in the paps it was also used as an embrocation for stiff joints and aching muscles the supposed curative value of beeswax in its natural state however was as nothing compared to its capabilities when distilled 
this preparation known as oil of wax and famous at the time all the world over seems to have come nearer the ideal of a panacea a cure-all than anything else before or since the making of oil of wax seems to have been a very complicated affair first the wax had to be melted poured into sweet wine and wrung out in the hands this was done seven times using fresh wine at each operation then the wax was placed in a retort with a quantity of red brick powder and carefully distilled a yellow oil came over into the receiver and this was distilled a second time when the coelestial or divine medicine was ready miraculous portents seem to have accompanied its preparation for we are told that in the coming forth of this oil there appeareth in the receiver the four elements the fire the air the water and the earth right marvellous to see the power to stop immediately the falling out of the hair heal the most serious wounds in a few days and cure toothache and pains in the back can be reckoned only among its minor virtues much greater properties were claimed for oil of wax for it not only killeth worms and cureth palsy and distempered spleens but it bringeth forth the dead or living child one last extract must be given from the same old writer it relates to the generation of bees and brings us out perhaps on the highest pinnacle of the marvellous after a learned dissertation on the method of breeding bees from a dead ox assuring us however that if we can procure a dead lion for the purpose it will be much better as then the bees will have a lion-like courage the writer goes on to explain how bees may be produced in another way we are to save all dead bees burn them sprinkle the ashes with wine and then leave them exposed to the sun in a warm place in a little while we are told all the bees so treated will come to life again and we shall then have a new stock ready for hiving dipping into these time-worn records of the middle ages with their embrowned scarce legible type and their antiquated phraseology one comes at last to realize how very little the old bee masters actually understood of the true ways of the honey-bee or indeed of any real essential in bee craft and yet the production of honey and wax must have been an industry very largely developed in those days somehow or other in spite of archaic theories and useless interference in the work of their hives these people must have contrived to supply a market of whose magnitude we can nowadays form little conception the trade in wax alone must have been a very large one for except in the poorest tenements this formed the only available source of artificial light and honey was in much more universal demand than it is now because cane sugar could hardly have developed into a serious rival as a sweetening agent among the masses at a time when it stood perhaps at two shillings a pound but in speculations of this kind it must be borne in mind that although the men who wrote about bees displayed so picturesque an ignorance in all matters appertaining to their charges these formed a very small minority among the beekeepers as a whole probably the bulk of the supply in honey and wax came from bee gardens whose owners neither knew nor cared anything about books and were concerned only in the practical side of the work 
where their knowledge hereditary for the most part amply sufficed for the part they played in it moreover it is only in latter-day scientific apiculture that the work of the bee master counts to any great extent nowadays under the light of twentieth century knowledge this is a competent to bring about the doubling and even trebling of the honey harvest possible under the ancient methods but the old skeppists did and could do little more than look on at the work of their bees and here and there put a scarce availing hand to it nearly all the credit for the results achieved in those days must be given to the bees themselves who untold ages before had brought to finite perfection their remarkable systems and policies in all likelihood the bee masters the practical men who owned the hives had much the same shrewd faculty of leaving things alone in far-off times as we observe among the skeppists of the last generation in many ways what they did at last come to do they did ill notably in the apparently insane practice of destroying the bees to obtain the honey but even this was not so foolish a procedure as it appears to-day it was a plain matter of business according to the lights of the time their process was to condemn to the sulphur pit all the lightest and the heaviest of their stocks experience taught them that the weak colonies stood little chance of getting through the winter unless they were artificially fed while if the bees of the large colonies were preserved after being robbed of their stores they would need the same provision it was a matter of arithmetic artificial feeding was then a much more costly affair than it is to-day and the reckoning came out well on the side of slaughter the worst part of the business so far as modern scientific bee breeders are concerned is that the old system of destruction tended to preserve only those strains of bees who were inveterate swarmers while the steady industrious stay-at-homes who accumulated the largest stores of honey were invariably exterminated this is a fateful legacy to have passed on when we consider that one of the chief aims of modern bee science is to abolish swarming altogether the swarming habit is one of the greatest obstacles in the way of a large honey yield and until a race of non-swarming bees has been evolved by modern breeders there will always be this element of uncertainty in the honey harvest latter-day beemen therefore join the chorus of disapproval of this old senseless custom of bee burning rather because it has given them the task of undoing the work of ages before any progress is possible then from the generally accepted humanitarian reasons End of chapter 3「4. Of the Law of the Honey Bee by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At the City Gates. In a village in southern Sussex, close under the green brink of the Downs, there live two beekeepers who represent, in their widely divergent methods and outlook, the extremes of beemanship as still extant in modern times the one dwells in a little ancient thatched cottage set in the heart of an old-fashioned english garden where dome-shaped hives of straw are dotted about at random amidst a wild growth of the old-fashioned english flowers the other has built himself a trim villa on a hillside topped with a sheltering crest of pine wood 
and here he has established a great modern honey farm replete with every device and system of management known to apiarian scientists throughout the two worlds one might suppose on leaving the village street on a fine may morning and coming upon these two settlements in the open country beyond that all the romance and old-world flavour of bee-keeping were inevitably to be found in the ancient bee-garden where the droning music of the hives seems to originate in the thicket of blossoming lilac and red may and veronica the hives themselves being the last things one noticed in such a tangle of bright-hued flowers to expect sentiment in the other quarter a great cindered tract of country with its long parallel rows of modern hives all painted in various colours its dwelling-house that might have been transplanted bodily from a well-to-do london suburb and its line of outbuildings with their bustle of business and coughing oil-engine and reverberation of hammer and saw was to expect something evidently out of date and impossible as well look for art in a ghetto as to seek reverence for ancient bee customs in a twentieth century trading concern such as this established to supply the market for honey just as a manchester factory turns out calico and corduroy many lovers of country life peripatetic artists and chance pedestrians for the most part came to the village with this notion firmly impressed upon them and visiting the old bee garden and finding the old beautiful things there in abundance went no farther and became no wiser they wandered round the crooked red tiled paths of the garden with its ancient proprietor stooped under bowers of living gold and purple waded through seas of scarlet poppy and blue forget-me-not and tawny mignonette came upon old beehives in all sorts of shady unpremeditated corners and steeped themselves in medievalism up to the eyes the very song of the bees seemed to belong entirely to past days none surely but a hopeless vandal could put a colony of bees in one of the ugly square hives and expect them to go honey-seeking in the old harmonious happy way sanctified of the ages and so they never ventured up the hill to the great bee farm but kept to the garden below and listened by the hour together to the quaint talk of its white-headed smock-frocked owner or stood valiantly at the foot of the ladder when he climbed up to dislodge a swarm from the moss-grown apple boughs or helped him to scour the new straw skeps with handfuls of mint and lavender or beat out weird unskilful music with the door-key on the old brass-pan when a swarm was high in the air much could be learnt it is true from quiet days spent in the old bee garden especially in may before the earliest swarms were ready to forsake the hives the first faculty to be acquired was that of wandering among the bees or standing between their straw houses undismayed at their incessant and often terrifying approaches whatever confidence one may place in beekeepers assertions that their bees never sting it is a bold man who can preserve entire equanimity when bees are settling continuously on his hands his face his clothing and a whole flying squadron of them are shrilling vindictively about his ears nothing will come of it he knows if only he can keep still 
but the tendency to turn and flee or at least to beat off these minor tree atoms with wildly waving arms is all but irresistible for the novice it is only their way he is assured of expressing or of satisfying their curiosity and this being done they fly off harmlessly enough to give a good report of him to the ruling powers within the hive but he knows that this report is sometimes anything but good at least there are a few luckless individuals in the world who dare not venture within a dozen yards of a beehive without being set upon unmercifully and chased by an angry squad of these tart virgins for the space of a quarter mile moreover in certain states of the weather when thunder is about and the air is tense and still bees will often sheathe their barbed daggers in any human skin even that of their owner who has gone among them daily all the season unmolested there is therefore a fateful element of chance in all near watching of beehives a sensation of being under fire fine discipline enough but for the timorous hardly to be reckoned among the easy joys of existence these first deterrents however being happily overcome the watcher is sure to be caught up sooner or later in the sheer fascination of the thing and to find himself recklessly almost breathlessly looking on at what is nothing else than a great informing pageant of life he stands as it were a stranger at the gates of a city inhabited by the most interesting and in some respects the most advanced people in the world of the inner life of the city apart from the deep busy murmur that surges out to him he learns nothing and will learn nothing until he puts sentimental pride in his pocket and makes pilgrimage to the great bee farm on the hill but here in the meanwhile is food enough to satisfy the keenest appetite for the marvellous in and out through the yawning entrance gate of the city under the hot may sunshine there are thousands of busy people coming and going the broad threshold of the hive is completely hidden under opposing streams the one setting out towards the fragrant fields and hedgerows the other tumbling and seething in almost every bee dragging after her some kind of mysterious treasure the outgoing bees start on their journey in two different fashions some emerge from the hive and rise at once on the wing lancing straight off into the sunshine and these are foragers who have already made several journeys afield since the sun broke hot and rosy over the eastward hill but others essaying their first excursion for the day creep out of the murmurous darkness of the hive and come with a little impetuous rush to the edge of the alighting board here they pause a moment to flutter their wings and rub their great eyes free from the hive twilight and then they lift into the air hover an instant with their heads towards their dwelling taking careful stock of it sweep up into the blue and volley away with the rest towards the distant hillside white with its bridal wreath of clover bloom the homing bees move much more sedately they come sailing in like bronze argosies laden to the water's edge those bearing full sacks of clover juice for the honey-making seldom carry an outside load of pollen as well they have all to do in bringing their distended bodies to a safe anchorage on the entrance board 
and charge headlong into the hive possessed of only one idea to hand their garnered sweets over to the first house bee they chance upon and then to hurry out in search of another load the pollen bearers are impelled by the same white hot energy but their cargoes are infinitely more cumbersome and demand a more leisurely pace some with panniers heaped up with a deep orange coloured material must rest a while on the threshold before gathering energy enough to drag their glowing burdens through the city gate others just fail to make the harbour and sink down on to the grass below to wait for the same freshet of strength that is finally to bring them into the security of the populous haven scores of them do not try for harbour at first tack but coming safely into the calm waters of the garden rest awhile on the nearest leaf or blossom panting and tremulous until they are able to wear sail for the last reach home there is infinite diversity in the loads of these pollen carrying bees hardly a colour or shade of colour in the rainbow fails to pass during every moment across the thronging way every bee carries a half globe of this substance beautifully rounded and shaped on each of her two hind legs it is possible by marking the colour of her burden to tell with certainty what flower she has been plundering on each of her trips this bright orange which makes always the largest and heaviest bales in the stream of merchandise is from the dandelions from the gorse flowers come loads of deep rich brown almost as weighty the charlock that mingles its useless wanton beauty with every farm crop yields the bee interminable gold white clover red clover sainfoin all load up the little hive coolies with different shades of russet from the apple orchards come bursting panniers of pale yellow the blackberry blossom yields pollen of a delicate greenish white when summer comes and the poppies make scarlet undertones amidst the wheat and barley these winged merchant women stream homeward with their pollen baskets laden with funereal black but if you watch a hive at work on any bright spring or summer morning you will see single bees occasionally pass with loads whose source has never yet been fathomed the lean glistening rufous stuff that is continually borne through the hustling crowd is resin gathered from poplar or pine and used to glue the straw hive down to its baseboard or to stop up draughty crevices and useless corners or diluted into varnish to paint the honeycombs with an acid proof preservative film but now and then comes a bee with a load whose colour shines up like a danger signal in darkness brilliant scarlet or soft rose crimson or pale lavender or gleaming white who shall say in what far forgotten nook of the countryside she has been adventuring or what rare blossom she has chanced upon in the wilderness and despoiling it of its maiden treasure greedily has quickened into duplication the beauty that was its reason for life yet the greatest wonder about all this pollen gathering is that each separate load has been taken entirely from one species of flower the little half spheres are packed into the pollen cells indiscriminately orange on brown pale yellow mingled with green or buff or grey but each pair of panniers representing a single journey 
contains the pollen dust of one kind of blossom alone going out into an english lane or meadow to watch the bees at work the first conviction borne in upon an observer is that the bees are darting about from flower to flower without other thought than to load up from any and every capable blossom that stands in their way but closer scrutiny reveals a curious plan and order in this as in everything else that the honey-bee undertakes tracing an individual bee in her progress along the flowery verge of the lane you will soon see that she visits only one species of blossom if she starts on hawthorn it will be hawthorn all the way if her load of willow herb nectar or pollen is not yet a full one she will overpass a score of tansy knots or waving jungles of meadow sweet just as inviting and resourceful apparently to reach the one scanty patch of purple at the end of the lane why she should be at such pains to keep the pollen separate as she gathers it only to get it inextricably mingled with every other kind in the storehouse at home is a problem that none but a bee can solve but all the honey-bee's reasons and motives in life are made up of a curious blend of cold-drawn sense and sentiment and it may be inferred that need and fancy have an equal influence in guiding her in this as in everything else she does from her cradle cell to her grave not altogether without seriousness it may be hazarded that quite as probable a reason for her way of pollen gathering is that she deems a certain shade of colour makes a more becoming flying robe as that she keeps each load of pollen pure unblended because of some imperious economic need of the hive the factor of sex in all observation of the ways of the honey-bee is no more to be considered a negligible one than it is in the critical contemplation of the human species of hive all this incessant coming and going of the busy foragers is alluring enough to the looker-on but there is evidence of many other activities equally interesting the work of collecting nectar and pollen is obviously only a part of the duties of this self-immolated spinster race here and there in the seething hurrying crowd there are bees who do not move with the rest but anchored securely in the full force of the living current with heads lowered and turned towards the hive are engaged in fanning their wings and this so swiftly that nothing of the wing but a little grey mist can be seen looking more carefully you will make out that these bees are arranged in nearly regular rows one behind the other in open order so that the conflicting tides of foragers can pass uninterruptedly between if the watcher is bold enough to bring his ear down to the level of the hive he will make out a steady hissing noise that rings clear above all the din and turmoil made by the incessant travellers to and fro these rows of fanners are seen to stretch from the hive door right to the edge of the footplate but principally on one side and still closer observation will reveal the fact that there is a regular system of relief among them though the general volume of sound never abates one jot every few minutes one or another of these stationary bees moves away her place being immediately taken by another who settles down to the common task in line with the rest the reason for all this is plain enough the fanners are engaged in ventilating the hive 
drawing a current of vitiated air through the entrance on one side which flanks but does not oppose a corresponding current of pure air sucked in on the other all through the warm days of spring and summer this fanning squadron is constantly at work nor does it cease with the darkness chill nights find the ranks weakened and reduced to perhaps only a few bees or even to none at all when a cold snap of weather intervenes but in the dog days or as the ancients used to say when sirius the honey star is shining the deep sibilant note of these fanners rises in a populous apiary almost to the voice strength of a gale of wind to come out then under the stars of a summer night and stand listening in the tense fragrant darkness to this mighty note is to get an impression of bee life unattainable at any other season in the daytime the sound is intermingled overwhelmed by the chorus of the flying bees but now all are safely at home each hive is packed from floor to roof with tens of thousands of breathing heat-producing creatures the necessity for ventilation is quadrupled and far and wide in the bee garden the fanning armies are setting to their work with a will the freshmen at this fascinating branch of nature study brought out into the quiet night to hear such gargantuan music is always strangely affected by it some natures incredibly so in all the great placid void of darkened hill and dale around him in the whole blue arch overhead alive with the flinching silver of the stars there is no sound but a chance trill of a nightingale the bark of a shepherd's dog on the distant upland or now and then the droning song of a beetle passing invisibly by all the world seems at rest save these mysterious people in the hives and with them the sound of labour is only redoubled bending down to the nearest hive in the darkness the note comes up to one like the angry roar of the sea a light brought cautiously to bear upon it discloses the alighting board covered with rows of bees working as it were for their lives while other bees continually wander in and out of the entrance the sentries that guard it night and day just as soldiers guarded the gates of human cities in olden times the novice at beecraft even the most staid and matter-of-fact is invariably plunged into marvelling silence at the sight but if the night be exceptionally hot and oppressive and the fanning army unusually large the bee master with an eye for dramatic effect generally finishes the tyro's wonderment by showing him an old trick he lowers the candle until the flame is just behind the squadron of ventilating bees and at once all is darkness the current of air drawn out of the hive has proved strong enough to extinguish the light it has been said that there are guard bees who watch the hive door day and night to the unskilled human eye one bee looks very like another and it is difficult to understand how in the many thousands that pass the guards manage to detect an intruder so unerringly and to eject her with such unceremonious promptitude as is always shown probably it is not by sight alone that these occasional interlopers are singled out the sense of smell in the honey-bee is extraordinarily acute and this no doubt assists the guards in their difficult work it is well known 
that a queen bee must possess a very distinct odour as her mere presence abroad even when shut up in a box will attract the drones from all quarters in all likelihood the peculiar aroma from each queen bee impregnates the whole colony and thus the guard bees are able at once to distinguish their own kin from that of alien stocks still watching the outside life of the hive in the old bee garden many other interesting things come to light in such an establishment even if it be only an old-fashioned straw skep perhaps more than twenty thousand individuals are located and obviously some regular system of cleaning and scavenging is indispensable this work can be seen now going on uninterruptedly in the midst of all the other busy enterprises every moment bees come labouring out bearing particles of refuse which they throw over the edge of the footboard and at once shoulder their way back for another load other bees appear carrying the bodies of comrades who have died in the hive and every now and then one comes struggling through the crowd bearing high above her a strange and ghastly thing perfect replica of herself but white throughout save for its black beady eyes this is the unborn bee dead in its cradle cell infant mortality is an evil not yet overcome even by the doughty honey-bee and many are carried out thus especially in early spring watching these undertakers of the hive in their gruesome but necessary work a singular fact can be noted while all other debris is merely cast over the brink of the entrance board where it accumulates day by day on the grass below these dead larvae are never disposed of thus they are carried right away their bearers taking wing and flying straight off over the hedgerow to drop them at harmless distance from the neighbourhood of the hive there is still another kind of work going briskly forward round the gates of the bee city certain among these stay-at-home bees seem to exercise a sort of common overseership they help those weighed down with too heavy a cargo to reach the city gates if a lump of pollen is dropped in the general scuffle these bees seize it and take it into the hive sometimes a bee comes eddying downward smothered from head to foot with pollen like a golden miller and she is immediately pounced upon by these superintendents and combed free of her incommodious treasure others see to the grooming of the young bees about to essay their first flight the youngster sits up protruding her tongue to its fullest extent while half a dozen bees gather round her licking and stroking her on every side at last her toilette is done and she is liberated when with a little flutter of her wings she lifts high into the blue air and sunshine and makes off with the rest to the clover fields glittering afar off in the joyous midday light for insensibly the hours have worn on it is noon and the tense thronging life the deep rich labour song of the bee garden seem to have reached their height but suddenly a greater noise than ever arises on all sides a steady stream of bees larger and bulkier than the rest is pouring out of every hive the drones the lazy brothers of these laborious vestals have roused at last from their sleep and are coming abroad for their daily flight 
in twos and threes in whole battalions they hustle out and begin their noontide gambols about the hive filling the air with a gay roistering song in a little while they will be all gone to their revels and the bee garden will seem by comparison strangely quiet but now the sudden accession of energy is unmistakable with the awakening of the drones there seems to be a new spirit abroad the air is no longer filled to overflowing with busy foragers many of these have joined the dance round the hives so that each bee dwelling is the centre of a singing gambling crowd moved rather by a spirit of play almost of idleness but this brief moment of relaxation soon passes the drones betake themselves to their marital pleasuring in the fields the noisy midday symphony dies down to the old steady monotone of work and the watcher at the gates of the bee city turns to retrace his steps down the flower garlanded way of the old pleasance satiated with wonders yet not satisfied his curiosity only quickened a thousandfold for that which has been inexorably held from him a glimpse of what is happening behind those baffling walls of straw wending slowly homeward and pondering he asks himself many questions what is the reason the final outcome of all this earnest well-directed labour what is done with the pollen that has been carried in all the morning long where there is obviously so much system and unanimity and ingenious division of endeavour there cannot fail to be a supreme and governing intelligence to allot the part that each must play this story of a queen of a single bee larger than all the rest to whom all pay allegiance and who spends her whole life in the dim labyrinth of the hive like the pope in the vatican is it a truth or only a figment of the ignorant bucolic brain if this queen exist if every hive have indeed its absolute monarch who directs the whole complex life and policy of the bee city where in the scale of reasoning creatures must she be placed and then if he be wise the student will learn at last to give the picturesque old bee garden its true appraisement ancient things conserve their beauty and win the love of the right kind of lovers more and more with every century that glides by only their usefulness their import in the tide of human knowledge and progress has gone with the years it is so with the bee garden under its may-tide robe of green leaves and rainbow blossoms it is beautiful in its glad appearances its echo of old voices its odour of the sanctity in ancient ways and days but it can tell us nothing of all we want to know it can only ask us riddles to which we have no answers for these we must set aside old fanciful scruples turn our backs once for all on its enchantment and its sweetness bend our steps unswervingly towards the great modern bee farm on the hill End of chapter 4chapter five of the law of the honey bee by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the commonwealth of the hive a doctor dryer's dust will manage to impart to the truths he meddles with a disastrous air of dullness and stagnation 
but to walk in a fool's paradise of beautiful artistic error is to lay oneself open to an infinitely worse fate there never was a truth in nature that was dull or uninteresting except in its human presentment there never was a pretty worthless fiction that did not show its dross and tinsel when brought out into the searching light of day romance the spirit of poetry have largely changed their venue of recent years the unconscionable delver among old things old thoughts old conventions on the strand of time has tarried so long in his one little florid corner that he is in some danger of being caught by the tide he must soon either mend his pace or swim for it human regard is turning more and more towards those who deal in living verities the men who search the stars who win new powers out of the common air who find at last the authentic teachings in the old worn texts of the stones and brooks these are the true poets romancists tellers of wondrous tales and these will hold the crowd which is never far astray in its intuitions when all the singers of sick fancies and the harpers on frayed golden strings have gone off in melancholy dudgeon to their own place the old story which has held such a long and honoured position in school textbooks and in the writings of those who tell of nature's wonders from the commanding watch-tower of the study fire the old story of the queen bee ruling her thirty or forty thousand dutiful subjects and guiding them unerringly in all their marvellous exploits and enterprises must go now with the rest for the truth as modern observers have unquestionably established it is that the queen bee is no ruler in the hive but even a more obedient subject than any the real instigators and contrivers of everything that takes place within the hive are the worker bees themselves the queen has neither part nor lot in the direction of the common polity nor has she any power mental or physical to help in the carrying out of public works her sole duty is that of motherhood and even in this she derives all initiative from the sovereign worker bees she is little more than an ingenious piece of mechanism and carefully guarded and cherished accordingly she has certain propensities and certain elemental passions which she can always be counted on to exercise in certain well-defined and limited ways but as an intelligent originating force she counts for nothing the mind in the hive is the collective mind of the whole colony apart from the queen and drones an hereditary communal intellect evolved through the ages the sum and total of all bee experience since the world of bees began if however modern science compels us to divest the mother bee of all her regal state and quality and thus destroy one of the prettiest delusions of ancient times it is only to take up a story of real life more alluring and romantic still in the light of new understanding the old facts take on a mystery and excite a wonderment greater than ever before if we found the life of the hive an enthralling study when we supposed it to originate from one winged atom endowed with acute and commanding abilities how much more fascinating must it prove when we come to see that all this complex system of government is instituted and kept together 
by the harmonious working of tens of thousands of reasoning beings reasoning it is a big word a double-edged thing that requires careful handling we have been so long accustomed to use it only in regard to our own magnificent mental processes that it savours almost of the ridiculous to bring it to bear upon such a tiny etc in the brute creation as the honey-bee and yet the deeper we go in the study of the bee and all her works the more difficult it becomes to find a word that shall more fittingly meet the case instinct will not do instinct implies a dead perfection of motive born of omniscience working through unthinking unvarying organisms to an equally perfect end but in neither project nor performance can the honey-bee be said invariably to achieve or even to aim at perfection it will be seen hereafter that her motives her methods the result she brings about all show frequent undeniable error or deviation she attempts to carry through a sound enterprise but abandons it on finding unforeseen difficulties in the way she will persevere blindly in an obviously foolish piece of business and fail to see her mistake until both energy and resources are at an end sudden emergencies may find her ready with the saving stroke of last ingenuity or merely plunge her into listless despair courage industry economy wise forethought or still wiser afterthought are all common traits in her nature but she may develop idleness unthrift slovenliness or even downright dishonesty if chance or circumstance indicate the way and what are all these but the defects or attributes of reason if bees and men each admittedly rooted in divinity be prone to the like failings and inconsequences who shall discriminate between them dividing arbitrarily natural cause and effect watching bees at work for the first time through the glass panels of an observation hive or in the almost equally informing modern hive with movable combs this question continually arises and there seems only one answer for it there is something curiously human-like in their movements over the crowded combs and the old comparison of a beehive to a city of men is never out of mind there are the incessant hurryings to and fro chance meetings of friends at odd street corners altercations where we can almost hear the surly complaint and tart reply busy masons and tilers and warehouse hands at work everywhere a hundred different enterprises going forward in every thronging thoroughfare or narrow side lane from the great main entrance to the remotest drone haunted corner of the hive you will see the huge full-bodied queen labouring over the combs from cell to cell with a circle of attendants ever about her in the highest stories of the hive the honey-makers are at work pouring the new garnered sweets into the vats or sealing over with impervious wax the mature honey where the nurseries are established in the central and warmest region of the hive the nurse bees are hurrying incessantly over the combs looking into each cell to mark the progress of the larvae giving each its due ration of bee milk or when the time arrives walling up the cell with a covering that shall ensure its privacy but freely admit the air 
here and there the young bees have awakened from their transforming slumber and are clamouring at the stoppings of their prenatal tombs gnawing their way out vigorously or thrusting forth red glistening ravenous tongues eager to end their long fast where these raw youngsters have at last won their way into existence they can be seen assiduously grooming themselves or searching the neighbouring comb for honey while the nurse bees are busy cleaning out the cells just vacated to make them ready for the queen when she comes by on her next egg-laying round and all these operations are going forward simultaneously on an incredibly large scale certain amazing scraps of information are given to the wandering onlooker which he hears but can at this stage in his progress seldom rightly estimate he is told that the queen is the only mother bee in the colony large as it is that in the prime of her maternity she will lay as many as three thousand eggs a day and that she has the power to produce either male or female eggs or none at all at will he is told that except when she leads forth the swarm she goes out of the hive only once in her life and this is her wedding trip on this one occasion she has traffic with the drones somewhere incredibly high up in the blue air and sunshine of the summer's day and that immediate death is her suitor's invariable portion that she returns at once to the hive and thereafter for the rest of her life which may endure for years she passes her time in immaculate widowhood yet retaining her fertility to the end she is pointed out to the gaping novice as she travels her unceasing round of the brood combs and her various attributes are explained to him he is shown how much larger she is than the worker bee how her bodily structure differs in a dozen important ways how her instincts and habits resemble those of the common worker hardly in a single particular finally he is told something at which the most polite credulity may well demur although the mother bee is to all appearances of a totally different race the egg from which she was raised was identical with that which produces the little worker her bodily size the change in the number and shape of her organs her mental differences are all due to treatment and diet alone there is no reason why she should not have been an ordinary neuter working bee nor why any one of the thirty or forty thousand little workers in a hive should not have become a great queen bee the sole mother of an entire colony save for the edict of the communal mind more wonderful still the drones the male bees the brothers never the fathers of their own hive as has been so often stated owe the fact of their sex entirely to the will or whim of the hive authorities working through the docile agency of the queen until the moment before the egg is laid the question of the sex of the resulting bee is held in abeyance this big lusty drone with exuberant masculinity obvious in every posture and act his totally different organism his incapacity for anything else than the fulfilment of the one office required of him for he cannot even entirely feed himself his habit of spending his life either in a comfortable lethargy of repletion at home or in amorous night errantry abroad this drone might have been a little plodding worker bee with shrunken yet elaborated body and curiously developed brain 
whose one idea in life is to get through the largest amount of work before death claims her and who is armed with a formidable poison sting while the drone has none it is useless at this stage to tell the learner that all these vital differences miracles indeed in the ordinary meaning of the word are brought about by the leading powers of the hive in certain simple easily explainable ways he has lost for the moment all sight of and interest in the details however extraordinary in the perception that has dawned on him of the vastness of the entire plan here is a community that to all appearances has solved every problem relating to the well-being and progress of a crowded highly organized society questions that are now vexing socialistic philosophers in the human world or are looming dark in the immediate future problems of numerical increase in relation to food supply the balance of the sexes communal or individual ownership in property due qualification for parenthood the hegemony of might or right all seem to have been happily settled long ago in this remarkable bee commonwealth in itself a prosperous well-conducted hive appears to offer a living example a perfect object lesson of what socialism carried out to its last and sternest conclusions must mean to human and apiarian communities alike here is a number of individuals counting anything from ten thousand to fifty or sixty thousand according to their condition and the time of year living healthily and comfortably in the space of a few cubic feet the principle all for the greatest good of the greatest number is elevated into a prime maxim to which every one must bow the fiction of royalty is maintained in harmony with the perfect republican spirit the females are supreme in everything the males in nothing growth of population is accelerated or retarded according to estimations of the immediate or future supply of food the proportion of the sexes is varied at will the rule that those who cannot work must not live is applied with relentless consistency all the garnered wealth of the state is held in common for the common good when the settlement becomes too populous and the boundaries cannot be extended a large part of its inhabitants are forced to emigrate taking with them only so much of the state property as they can carry in their haversacks and relinquishing all claim to the rest the governing females have apparently agreed among themselves that only one of their number shall exercise the privilege of motherhood and when her fertility declines she is deposed and a new mother bee specially raised for the purpose installed in her place all these and a host of other facts as to bee life are crowded into the bewildered brain of the tyro until its capacity is exhausted and he can take no more he begins to see at length that he is approaching a great matter too fast and from the wrong direction like a scholar who resolving on a new and difficult branch of study commences at the end of his treatise instead of at the beginning he finds himself in the midst of terms and equations of which he knows nothing all this desultory peering into hive windows and listening to scraps of astounding information is nothing but opening the book of bee life here and there at odd disjointed pages getting a swift impression of certain lurid kaleidoscopic details 
but no grounding in the consecutive science of the facts there is nothing for it if he be resolved to know the life of the honey-bee truly but to turn back to the first page of the volume and steadily work his way through to the end if end there be all know the english honey-bee the black bee as she is called partly to distinguish her from her foreign rivals and partly it would seem because she is not black at all but a rich brown but all do not know her origin probably she came to us from the tropics by easy stages swarm outflying swarm until the most adventurous crossed the english channel in remote ages when it was only a narrow race of water or even before great britain was detached from the mainland it was the black bee and not the motley coloured italian or other varieties who came to us thus for the same reason probably that the celts came because they were a hardy race loving and being more fitted for the bracing northern atmosphere than the heat and languor of the south modern bee breeders who are trying so hard to acclimatize in britain the golden girdled or silver fringed bee races of other lands might well ponder this fact no keener controversy rages today among english bee masters than this one of the relative merits of native and foreign stocks but assuredly nature has not erred in this respect south down sheep can be reared in any county but nowhere so fine as on the sussex downs the like principle holds good with the english bee the ages have evolved her from her tropic beginnings to make her what she is a doughty essentially british creature thriving against all odds of fickle climate when her more tender sisters from the south are hard put to it for a living she has held her own against them and more than her own in bumper seasons such as we get all too rarely when in sober truth the land is flowing with honey there is little to choose between the rival honey-makers but through good and bad early and late for steady dogged industry invincible hardihood tangible results the english black bee has outdistanced all competitors thousands of years have gone to her making and thousands more may conceivably fit the yellow-skirted ligurian for british work but labour for so remote a posterity were altruism meter for angels than for men in her old primeval fastnesses the honey-bee is little likely to have troubled herself with hive-making but to have hung her combs to some convenient branch in the forest much as the bees in india do to-day the habit of seeking some hollow tree or cleft in the rock grew upon her probably as she advanced northward and some nightly or seasonal shelter became more and more an imperious need the present-day customs of wild creatures give some inkling of their ancestral ways but it is in their occasional aberrations from these customs that we get the truest indications of what their original state must have been lost swarms of bees if they fail to pitch upon some better site will often build in the open either suspending their waxen houses from some horizontal branch or making them in the heart of a thick bush the ways of the honey-bee are full of such deviations due perhaps to the working of old ancestral memory rousing dimly in the midst of modern needs the issue of a swarm may be nothing else than the survival of an old process 
vital enough in its day but under the present civilised conditions of bee life lacking the wet of entire necessity for in all respects the life of the bee ancient as it is is an evolved civilization and not a surviving aboriginal state it is conceivable that the foxes have their holes and the birds their nests much after the same fashion as in the days when adam invented love-making but the twentieth century honey-bee is not of this kind the communal habit itself may even have been a comparatively late introduction in her progress it is possible to get some idea of the path she has won for herself through the ages by studying the ways of creatures now living but immeasurably less advanced than the bee there are distant connections of hers lonely little wood wasps and others which never associate with their kind but get through the short summer hours in solitude and die with the waning season leaving the perpetuation of their species to the children they never see the common wasp is nearer the honey-bee in development but still infinitely far behind the fecundated queen wasp comes out of her winter hiding place fashions a cell or two in some hole in the ground and deposits her first eggs thus laying the foundations of a colony which populous enough in the season must nevertheless perish with the next winter chills in the primeval tropics the honey-bees may have lived in separate families each with its teeming mother its indolent lyre-bed father the turvy drop of creation and its bevy of youngsters every one going out when grown to establish a home for itself the modern bee city with its complicated systems and laws and its innumerable multitudes may have originated only when change of habitat and climate brought about the necessity for a new order of things living in perpetual warmth in a land where blossom followed blossom in unending succession there would be no need for such cooperation the one little family snuggling close in its moss-roofed corner could sustain its own temperature and where there was an unceasing array of nectar producing flowers foresight would have been folly the winter larder would have been left to take care of itself but as the young bees leaving their homes and flying ever northward came first into temperate zones and then into the fringe of arctic influences the conditions gradually changed the perpetual sipping garden was left behind and a season came in each year short at first but inevitably lengthening when there were no flowers hard necessity must have taught the bee then first to gather together with her kind for warmth during the cold season and then as this got longer and longer to make some food provision for winter days that would eke out endurance until the spring sun again wooed the earth into flower giving thus the first communal bee nests must have been evolved from the universal need of the race the first common storehouses instituted a host of unforeseen difficulties and side issues encountered and means for dealing with them contrived the spirit of invention must have been busy then with the race and taxed to the limit of her resources for never did pandora open celestial casket upon earth with more redoubtable consequences than when the great artificer set up the honey-bee as an exemplar of city-building to the nomadic world of men 
from the crowding together of the separate bee families for mutual protection against the elements to a complete and permanent fusion of life and interests must have been only a step as nature works but then there must have been stirring times social upheavals educative disasters a cataclysmic war of sex bee life must have been shaken to its very foundations when and how the woman bee first got the upper hand in the direction of affairs it is unimportant to determine but it is certain that she got it and has kept it ever since the population problem must have been the great overwhelming one with hundreds of prolific mothers in the hive each having enough to do at home in rearing her own children and a crowd of lazy irresponsible drones who could do nothing but dance in the sunshine or go a wooing how were the daily needs of the hive to be satisfied leaving out of account the provisions that must be made for coming winter days it was clearly a case of reform or annihilation and it may be conceived that the woman bees in default of masculine initiative took the reins into their own hands it is a prophetic story first they discovered their latent powers the harmless overpositor revealed itself as a prime weapon of offence thus the army was with the revolutionaries and the rest was easy a great far-reaching scheme was set afoot motherhood was to be a privilege of the few and the fittest work the compulsory lot of the mass hard times had already bred a lean unfertile gang among them and it was discovered that famine rations in the nursery meant a wholesale increase in these natural spinsters of the race henceforth the little sex atrophied worker bee was multiplied in the hive while the fully nurtured mothers were gradually reduced to a few at last to one alone it was a triumph of collective self-sacrifice for the well-being and high persistence of the race all this may be imagined as having taken place in infinitely remote times long before man succeeded in distinguishing himself from the apes in the honey-bee of to-day and her life in the modern hive we get a sort of quintessence of the ages a creature developed in mind and body by her unique conditions these conditions again imposing upon her unique systems of life like ruskin's venetian she must live nobly or perish much more is required of her than the role of domestic and political economist to make the modern beehive a possibility there must be architects mathematicians and chemists within its walls sanitary science must have its skilled exponents or the hive would change into a death trap within a few hours there must be land surveyors ready to explore the country just before the issue of the swarms to determine for them their new location there must be overseers gang for women everywhere to superintend every work in progress throughout the hive above all there must be a supreme central power a far-seeing intelligence to divine the imminent common need and to set the forces of the state to work in right time and order to provide for it if all these cannot be proved to exist in a hive of bees to-day at least the necessity for them is undeniable and as undeniable the achieved results End of chapter five